Let us pray. So, dear God, we now give you our time. Here. We give you our time that we may hear from you. In Jesus' name, amen. Most of Scripture speaks to us. The Psalms speak for us. That is how the 4th century Christian theologian Athanasius, living and working in the city of Alexandria in northern Egypt, expressed the role of the Psalms in the believer's life. Most of Scripture speaks to us. The Psalms speak for us. Or, Or more exactly, most of Scripture speaks to us about the living God. The Psalms speak for us to the living God. On my birthday in 1989, that's 34 years ago now, a friend from Manila, the Philippines, sent me a book on the Psalms, which more than any other book has changed the way I pray. Not only the changing the way I read the Psalms, but setting me on a path of praying that I have lived ever since. The book is by Eugene Peterson, the author of The Message, his paraphrase of the whole Bible. And the particular book that my friend sent me had just been published a few months before my birthday. The book is entitled Answering God. And it is, to my mind, the best introduction to the purpose of the Psalms presently available to us. In the book, Peterson calls us modern and postmodern and post-postmodern followers of Jesus to a discipline of letting the ancient psalms shape the way we pray. The operative word there is discipline. He's calling us to a discipline of letting the ancient psalms shape the way we pray. And the verbs he uses for this discipline are tutor and mentor. Peterson calls us to let these ancient psalms tutor us in prayer and worship. He calls us to let the ancient poems and prayers mentor us in conversation and communion with the living God. Peterson, following the lead of spiritual coaches throughout the centuries, says the Psalms are prayers that train us in prayer. The Psalms are prayers that train us in prayer. In answering God, Peterson proposes a straightforward, uncomplicated training program. Here it is. You might want to write this down, either on your iPhone or in your Bible or your journal. It's very important. Here it is. Three words. Ready? Just do it. (laughs) Before Nike. Just do it. Start with the first psalm. Pray it, or pray whatever it inspires you to pray. Go to the second psalm, pray it, or pray whatever inspires you to pray. Go to the third psalm, then the fourth psalm, then the fifth psalm, and keep going. Day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, decade after decade, over and over again and again, as long as we have breath. So, on my birthday in 1989... Although I had been reading and praying the Psalms as part of my yearly reading through the whole Bible, I took up the program. I just did it. And I've stayed with it for 34 years now. I do not know where I would be without the Psalms. My only regret is that I did not start the program earlier in my walk with Jesus. So over the summer, the leadership of the way is inviting us to just do it, to intentionally let the Psalms tutor, mentor, coach, you pick the verb, into richer conversation and communion with the triune God of grace. And I'd like to begin this series by reading the first two Psalms. For centuries, ever since 500 B.C. or so, when the 150 psalms were gathered together in one book, the people of God have realized that Psalm 1 and 2 go together for many reasons, but chiefly, Psalm 1 begins, blessed are, and Psalm 2 ends, blessed are. Blessed, blessed, bracketing the two books. 
The two psalms also share a number of common words that I'll name later on. So, hear the word of God. Psalm 1 and 2. It'll be up there. In fact, I'm going to read it, looking at it to make sure I'm reading the right words. All right? Hear God's word. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. I'm sure many of you have noticed who know the Psalms and those who have not, I'll help you notice. Notice that. Blessed is the one who does not walk or stand or sit. That's usually the progress. You start to walk and then you're intrigued and you start to stand and then you're really intrigued and you sit in the wrong place. But whose delight, the blessed one, whose delight is in the law of the Lord, who meditates on his law day and night, that person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season. And those, and whose leaf does not wither, whatever they do prospers, not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up, the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed ones, saying, now this is the speech of the kings, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I become your father. Ask me, and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them into pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings... Be wise, be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Kiss his son or he will be angry and your, your way will lead to your destruction. For his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all those who take refuge in him. The word of the Lord. And you can say thanks be to God. The Psalms are the prayer book of Israel. For centuries, whenever God's people gathered for worship, whether in a synagogue or private home, they read and prayed the words of the Psalms. The Psalms are also the prayer book of the church. For centuries, whenever disciples of Jesus gathered for worship, whether in sanctuaries or in private homes, they read and prayed the prayer book. Oh, they prayed spontaneously, but they primarily let the book speak what needed to be spoken. And most significantly, the Psalms are, get this, the prayer book of Jesus of Nazareth. When the Lord Jesus, in his humanity, prayed, he prayed by the book. <laughs> Ever realize that? In his humanity, the Savior of the world was trained to pray by praying the Psalms. In his humanity, the eternal Son of God was mentored in prayer by praying through the Psalms. The, the picture I get is Jesus going around in the back pocket. He's got the book. And he's learning to pray by the book. Now, how do we know this? For three reasons. First, Jesus regularly participated in the life of the local synagogue as was his habit, says the, the writer of the third gospel. Jesus regularly showed up for worship on Sabbath in the synagogue, where, as I already mentioned, the communal prayers were the Psalms. A number of scholars have suggested that most synagogues read and prayed the Psalms following a three-year cycle, 50 Psalms a year. As Jesus worshiped with his local congregation, Sabbath after Sabbath after Sabbath, he entered into psalmic, is, is that a word? If it's not, I'm going to coin it. Psalmic communion and communication with his Father. 
Secondly, we know that Jesus prayed and sang the Psalms because he grew up learning them from his mother. I'm told that one of the chief responsibilities of a mother in the first century was to teach their children to pray. Mary prayed the Psalms, and Jesus would have watched her and listened to her as she did. Now, we know that Mary prayed the Psalms for a number of reasons, but mostly because this was reflected in the song she sang when she, she was pregnant with Jesus. It's the song we call the Magnificat. It's recorded in the first chapter of Luke, a song which many have observed turns the world upside down. My soul magnifies the Lord. He has done great things for me. And then goes on to name those great things using the language of the prayer book. Her song is soaked with images and promises from the Psalms. Her song clearly emerges out of a heart that's been trained by the Psalms. It's a very tender picture to me. Mary teaching the one who would become the king of the world by reading psalms to him and singing those psalms over him. Thirdly, we know that Jesus prayed the psalms because Jesus prayed the psalms while hanging on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Echoing Psalm 22. I thirst, echoing Psalm 69, the psalm that also speaks of soldiers gambling for the garments of an innocent sufferer. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, echoing Psalm 31, which also affirms my times are in your hands. Someone has observed that when we pass through the valley of the shadow of death, our hearts will pray the words that are deeply rooted in us by prayer. Jesus praised the Psalms because he prayed them all his earthly life. All to say that when we submit to the praying, our, when we submit our praying to the tutoring and mentoring of the Psalms, we are entering into one of Jesus' own spiritual disciplines. We are praying the prayers he prayed. We are singing the songs he sang. It turns out he is the one great psalm prayer. Which is why when the early church began to form its Christology, Christology, a way of understanding who Jesus is, the chief place the early church turned in the Bible to understand who Jesus is, is the Psalms. Especially Psalm 2. The Psalm about the Son who would become the King. The Psalm which the Father spoke over Jesus the Son at the Son's baptism. I like how Denise Domboski Hopkins puts it in her very helpful book, Journey Through the Psalms. The early church used the Psalms to help interpret Christ and Christ became the interpretive key for unlocking the Psalms. Now, over the past 34 years of just doing it, I've come to agree with what the saints who have gone before us say about the blessing of this training program. Martin Luther, for instance, who sparked the 16th century Protestant Reformation. The Psalms are a book of all saints, and everyone, in whatever situation they may be, finds in that situation psalms and words that fit their case and suit him or her as if they were put there just for his or her sake so that they could not put it better themselves or find or wish for anything else. So often, when I go to the next psalm, I find myself saying, that's exactly what I need to pray. Or I find myself saying, I never thought I could pray that. John Calvin, 16th century reformer. The Psalms are anatomy, an anatomy of all parts of the soul. They are a mirror in which we see the motion of our own souls. So often I'll read a Psalm and I'll look at it and say, no, that's the, not the anatomy of my soul. And I sit with it longer and I go, oh my goodness. That's exactly how my soul works. And I now need to pray in a different way. Charles Spurgeon, one of the greatest preachers in church history, in the 19th century says, time was when the Psalms were not only rehearsed in all the churches from day to day, but they were so universally sung that common people knew them even if they did not know the letters in which they were written, even if they couldn't read. They were the love songs of the people of God. Could any other be as pure and heavenly? These sacred hymns expose all modes of holy living. They are fit for childhood and old age. They furnish maxims for the entrance of life, and they serve as watchwords at the gates of hell. 
And he says of Psalm 119, which is the longest of all the Psalms, that it involves us in the art of holy living. Then Philip Yancey of the 20th and 21st century, the Psalms comprise a sampling of spiritual journals. They are personal letters to God. They're also communal, but they are personal letters to God. They are personal prayers in the form of poetry written by a variety of people in wildly fluctuating moods. I come to them not primarily as a student wanting to acquire knowledge, but as a pilgrim wanting to acquire relationship. And then one more testimony, the Old Testament scholar Bernard Anderson. I think that's the one next, yes. I love this one. There's an old Jewish prescription for help in time of trouble. Drink a warm glass of milk and read the Psalms beginning at the beginning and taking them as they come. So for the rest of this introductory message, let me simply list for you some facts about the prayer book as a whole that can help us make progress in this training program. Four facts. First fact, the Bible as a whole is made up of five other separate sections. Those assembled the whole book, gathered the prayers and the poems, written over a period of over a thousand years from Moses to after the exile, gathered them into five smaller books. So you have book one, Psalm 1 to 42, book two, Psalm 42 to 72, book three, Psalm 73 to 89, book four, Psalm 90 to 106, and book five, Psalm 107 to 150. Now, as you make your way through this, these books, you discover there's also an introduction and a conclusion. The introduction, Psalms 1 and 2, bracketed by blessed. The conclusion, Psalm 146 to 50, each of those five uh, bracketed by hallelujah, hallelujah, 10 times hallelujah. So the whole book looks like this. An introduction, Psalm 1 and 2, book 1, book 2, book 3, book 4, book 5, and a conclusion, 146 to 150. Now, each of those five books ends with the word blessed. Book one, blessed be the Lord. Book two, blessed be the Lord, bless his glorious name. Book three, blessed be the Lord. Book four, blessed be the Lord. And book five, all flesh will bless his holy name. Now within those five books, there are various collections, um, such as, I I don't think, did we use that slide? Yeah, we did. It'll just be there, but you don't have to remember this. Don't worry about getting all the data down. Just let me comment on it. There's special collections. For instance, there are David 1, David 2, and David 3. Three different collections of David's psalms spread out through the five books. There are songs by Korah, two sections of those. Korah was the leader of a worship guild in the life of Israel. Uh, There are psalms by Asaph, 73 to 83. Asaph's a a seer. He's a prophet. So he tends to see things in black and white terms. It discourages him. And then he prays these lament psalms and gets to a place of prayer. I love the Asaph psalms. And then there are the the Hellel Passover psalms over here, 113 to 118. I point those out because 118 would be the hymn that Jesus and his disciples sang as they left the upper room and went to the Garden of Gethsemane. And then you have uh, the Hallelujah Psalms, the Yahweh Reign Psalms, so a collection of psalms within those five books. Five books in the big book. Are you following me okay on that? Now, why five? Why not four? Why not six? Because prayer is responding to God's speech. Prayer is responding to God's speech. God has spoken to his people in five books. We respond in five books. God has spoken in Torah, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and we respond in five books, which is a way of saying that prayer that pleases God does not simply emerge from within us. That's okay, but that's not the essence of prayer. Indeed, prayer that pleases God is not generated by us at all. Prayer that pleases God is the response of the human heart and mind to God speaking to the human heart and mind. Hence the title of Eugene's book, Answering God. The prayers of the prayer book are praises to God in light of what God has revealed about himself. 
or their prayers would, that grapple with all the apparent incongruity between who he has revealed himself to be and what life in this world is really like. Our speaking to God is ultimately generated by God speaking to us. All made clear by the whole book being crafted into five books. God speaks to us in five books. We speak back in five books. Second fact to help us in the training program. Yet within this nice, neat structure, there is no nice, neat order to the prayers within it. When I first sought to be mentored by the Psalms, I expected to find a nice, neat order. And one day I would write a little essay about this order. I expected to see a series of praise psalms, and then lament psalms, and then thanksgiving psalms, and then teaching psalms. It doesn't work that way. I cannot find any order within the five books. That's because life does not move in a nice, neat order. I wish it did. The Psalms are praying in response to God speaking into the messiness of life. And that's why the Psalms are not all polite. That's because life's not polite. The Psalms are not all peace because life is not all peace. The Psalms are not all polite because life is not polite. So we have what I could call up Psalms and down Psalms. Because that's how life is, up days and down days. Do I have a witness? Indeed, up hours, down hours, and the same up and, day, day, up and down day. And thus, as we pray through the book, we find psalms together that you wouldn't put together. For instance, back to back are Psalm 22 and 23. Psalm 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then Psalm 23, 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall lack nothing. When I go through the valley, you are with me. Which is it, feeling forsaken or with me? Yes. <laughs> we have back to back, Psalm 102 and 103 that Chris read. Psalm 102, hear my prayer, O Lord, let my cry for help come to you. Do not hide your face from me in the day of my distress. Incline your ear to me in the day when I, answer, when I call, answer me quickly. For my days have been consumed in smoke. My bones have been scorched like a hearth. My heart has been smitten like grass and has withered away. Indeed, I forget to eat my bread. Because of the loudness of my groaning, my bones cling to my flesh. I resemble a pelican in the wilderness. I become like an owl in the waste places. I lie awake. I have become like a lonely bird on a housetop. And then Psalm 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Do not forget any of his benefits, who heals all your disease, pardons your iniquities, redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion, who satisfies your years with good things, so your youth is renewed like the eagle. What is it, a life of a pelican or a life of an eagle? Yes. And that is why John Calvin went on to say, after what I quoted earlier, I quoted, he says, the Psalms are anatomy of all parts of the soul. He then went on, then went on to say, all griefs, sorrows, fears, misgivings, hopes, cares, anxieties, in short, all the disquieting emotions with which the minds of humans are wont to be agitated, the Holy Spirit has pictured them exactly. And the Psalms then, Give us the freedom and the words to pray that full range of messy emotions. Ups, emotions, down emotion, pleasant emotions, disturbing emotions, joy and sorrow, love and hate. Sometimes in the same psalm. Psalm 139, one of my favorites, verses 17 to 18. How precious are your thoughts to me, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would outnumber the sand. When I awake, I'm still with you. Nice place. Next verse. Oh, that thou would slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, people of bloodshed, for they speak against you wickedly. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do not I loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with the utmost hatred. They have become my enemies. <laughs> Therefore, the whole book and each of the small five books contain different types of prayers. There are praise psalms, lots of them. There are request psalms, 
Lots of them. Deliver me, forgive me, restore me, lead me, teach me. There are celebration psalms. O Lord, you are good. Your love, O Lord, endures forever. Psalm 136, 26 times. Your loving kindness is everlasting. Your loving kindness is everlasting. Apparently, there were praise songs with lots of repetition years ago. (laughs) There are recital psalms narrating God's history with his people, reminding us of the of manna in the morning and quail at night and bringing water out of the rocks and bringing honey out of the rocks. There are thanksgiving psalms. There are cursing psalms. <laughs> Probably the most disturbing part of the psalms, which we will discover later on turn out to be very, very liberating. There are the teaching psalms, like Psalm 1, 19, 119. There are sin psalms, like 32 and 51. Confessing and coming clean, seeking forgiveness and reconciliation, and finding grace and mercy beyond all understanding. Blot out my transgressions, wash me of my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin, create in me a clean heart, renew a steadfast spirit in me, keep your servant from presumptuous sins, do not let them rule over me, do not let any iniquity have dominion over me, do not cast me away from your face, do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Praying out every dimension and consequence of our sin. They're lovely psalms. And then there are their lament psalms. Actually, lament is about one-third of the psalms. How long, O Lord? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long will the enemy exalt, be exalted over me? Lament is not just complaining. Lament is wrestling with God. You said... You are the God who is there with me and for me. And what I'm going through now calls all that into question. And I want you to get an answer from you. Bold. Up sounds, songs, down songs, joy songs, sorrow songs. They're all there, woven into the fiber of the pages of the book, telling us that all of life is gathered up in prayer, telling us that we can bring it all to God, telling us that we can be bold in prayer and that we can be honest in prayer. There's no plastic piety to the psalms. A genuine encounter answering C.S. Lewis's prayer, may it be the real I who prays, and it may it be the real you to whom I pray. The Psalms helps us get real. Okay? That's the second. Third fact to help us in the training program. The first two Psalms are not prayers. As we turn to the Psalms to be tutored and mentored in prayer, we discover that the first two Psalms are not prayer. Did you notice that as we read Psalm 1 and 2? They're not prayers. Why is this? Why when we open the book to be taught how to pray are the first two Psalms not prayers? Because when we go to pray, we are not ready to pray. To pray authentically. Many scholars have made this observation, but Eugene Peterson made the point best. The text that teaches us to pray doesn't begin with prayer. That's because we're not ready We're too wrapped up in ourselves, and we are knocked around by the world. I mean, how can we pray when we've got all this stuff going on inside of us? So when we turn to be taught in prayer, the book recognizes we're not ready to do so. Would you agree we're not ready to do that? So Psalm 1 and 2 help us get ready. How? Well, the two Psalms clearly belong together. Not only because, as we noted, they're bracketed by blessed are, Psalm 1, blessed are, Psalm 2, blessed are, but because they share a lot of common names together. Meditate, weigh, stand, sit, scoff, counsel, perish. All of this suggesting to some scholars that Psalm 1 and 2 were originally one psalm, placed at the beginning of the prayer book to help us get ready. Again, how? How do they help us get ready to pray? Psalm 1 helps us center. Psalm 2 gives us perspective. By the way, the best commentary on Psalm 1, if you want to read further, is Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And the best commentary on Psalm 2, if you want to read later, is Jesus' Apocalypse, the last book of the Bible. The whole book is built on Psalm 2. Okay, Psalm 1 helps us center. It helps us settle down so we can concentrate in prayer. Our youngest daughter played baseball in elementary school right on through high school. She's really good. And when in elementary school, before each game, her coach at that time would gather the girls together in a circle and he'd calmly say to them, settle down. 
settle down. It was fun to watch him. Just settle down. And then he would say, during the game, listen to my voice. No one else's. Do not listen to the voice of the other coach. And do not listen to the voice of your parents. <laughs> Psalm 1, our daughter's son played in a championship game last night. And the coaches, you know, were trying to speak to the voice. And one of the fathers was over here yelling from the hill. And he was distracting his kid. He was up to, anyway, he was distracting. I think they finally moved him. You only listen to one voice when you play the game. You only listen to the coach. You only listen to one voice when you live the Christian life. Just one voice. So Psalm 1 serves us in the same way. By calling us from listening to all other words that we hear to listening to God's word. Walk not in the counsel of the wicked. Stand not in the way of the sinners. Sit not in the seat of scoffers. But delight in the law of the Lord. The Hebrew word rendered law means more than what we think of when we hear the word law. It's the Hebrew word Torah. I'm sure many of you have heard that before. Now, Torah includes law, but it encompasses so much more. So the best translation that I use for Torah is God's self-revelation. Torah derives from the verb yara, and yara means to throw something so as to hit the mark. It's used of throwing a javelin. When the person who throws the javelin throws it from behind the head, alongside the head, and then to hit the target. God's Torah is God throwing his word at us right past his head, so to speak, and aiming it at us and always hitting the target. In the process of his throwing it, what's in his head then is thrown to us, what's on his mind is thrown to us. And that's why the psalmists love the law. They love God's law. They love his Torah because in this Torah, God has told us who we are, who, we, who he is, and he's told us what it means to be human. Ah, oh, it's a good Torah. Lord, please, take your javelin and do it. This is who I am, and this is who you are. That's why they love it. So, Psalm 1 helps us get ready to pray by calling us to delight in Torah. To delight in what God has told us about himself. And to delight in what God has told us about what it means to be human. Another way to put it. Stop listening to the wicked and sinful and scoffers. And listen again to the voice of God, and you'll be ready to pray. Psalm 1 helps us in another way. It calls us from one action to another, from the action of walking, standing, and sitting in the places where we're not hearing his voice to the action of meditating on Torah day and night. The word meditate is the word used of cows chewing their food, munching and munching, munching and munching. If you ever watch cows, they do it all day long. Just munch and munch and munch. And Psalm 1 is calling us to not spend our time chewing on the newspaper or TV or Apple News or Facebook or Instagram. Maybe you have to once in a while, but not all day. Instead, to chew on all that God has revealed about himself and all that he has revealed about what it means to be human. Spend all day munching. Psalm 2. Psalm 2 helps us by putting everything into perspective. I have set my king on my holy mountain. The powers that seem to rule the world and intimidate us are not ultimate. The enemies we're worried about and will begin to pray about in Psalm 3 are not ultimate. Psalm 2 calls us to hear God's word to the world again, to the world. But as for me, I have set my king on my holy mountain. This turns out to be the theological theme of the whole book of Psalm. The Lord reigns. Psalm 30, 93, 1. The Lord reigns. 97, 1. The Lord reigns. 99, 1. The Lord reigns. 145. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your kingdom endures through all generations. In the face of all the arrogance and bravado of humans who think they rule, Psalm 2 helps us hear the voice of the true ruler. I have installed my king on my mountain. It's, there, it's like, is there, <laughs> it is as if before we begin to pray, the one to whom we pray says, let's get one thing straight. Don't worry. 
I've already put my king on the throne of the universe. The function of Psalm 2 is to put everything, all the other voices, the voices that threaten us and the voices that entice us in the context of the voice of God. I've installed my king, who then says to his king, you are my son, ask of me and I'll give the nations as your inheritance. Those are the very words God the Father spoke to God the Son at Jesus' baptism. Psalm 2 serves the same function as our Father who art in heaven in the prayer that Jesus would later teach us. It puts all that we fear into perspective. And then we're ready to pray Psalm 3. And Psalm 2 helps us by calling us to the only truly secure place in the universe. Blessed are those who take refuge in him. Refuge in the Son, who is the King. Refuge is the other great theme. The Lord reigns. Take refuge in him. 25 times take refuge in him. Twelve times take refuge in him. Along with other synonyms like rock, shield, fortress, shelter, shadow, stronghold, dwelling, strong tower. This is all, this is what the kings and queens of the world are supposed to do. Give protection and provide security, especially for the poor and the oppressed and the marginalized. So as we go now, further into the book and begin to pray about enemies, the word comes in the very first line of Psalm 3. Psalm 2 is saying, do not be afraid. There is a king who cannot be toppled. There is no refuge from him, but there is refuge in him. And in that light, we are ready to pray. And now we can speak because we've heard God speak, I have set my king on my holy mountain. Fact four. The one to whom we pray has a name. The God the psalmist know has a name, and they love to speak it. It's found in the first word of the first line of the truly first prayer, Psalm 3. Indeed, it's the first word of the first prayer prayed in the book. It's buried under the English word Lord. And Psalm 1 and 2 get us ready to pray by bringing us into this word. Psalm 3, verse 1, O Lord, all in capital letters. Now, as many of you know, and I wish everyone knew, that term Lord is hiding the name Yahweh. The God the psalmist knows is Yahweh. Lord is his title. Yahweh is his name. Reverend Doctor is my title. Daryl is my name. I like to be called by name. God's name takes us back thousands of years to that moving scene in the desert Recorded in Exodus 3. Moses, the great patriarch, is taken by this bush that's on fire but not being burned up. And as he approaches the bush, he hears a voice tell him to take off your shoes because you're on holy ground. The voice says, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. The Exodus text says that Moses then hid his face because he did not want to look at this God. The voice continues, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I'm aware of their suffering and I come down to deliver them. I see, I hear, I feel, I come down to deliver. Moses has never heard of a God like that. Most of the world has never heard of a God like that. This is an entirely new revelation. So he asks, what's your name? At that time, name was a way of saying nature and character. At that time, if you knew a person's name, you knew that person's nature and character. At the burning bush, Yahweh experiences new divine revelation, new dimensions of divine character and nature that he never knew before. So he asked, what is your name? I see, I hear, I feel, I come down. Moses never heard of such a God, so there must be a name for this God. And God answers, my name is Yahweh. I am who I am, all in that verb, Yahweh. And it means, I am there with you and for you. I see your suffering. I hear your cry. I feel your suffering. And so I come down. I am the great I am. I am Yahweh. Now, the devout people of God were afraid to say that name. 
out of fear of breaking the third commandment of the Ten Commandments. Third commandment, you shall not take the name of Yahweh your God in vain. And so when they read through the Old Testament and came to the term Yahweh, they wouldn't say it. Instead, they would substitute Adonai, which means master or Lord. And that aversion to speak the name continues into our time. But, and this now is the price, worth the price of a mission today. The third commandment does not prohibit saying the name of Yahweh. We do not take the name of Yahweh in vain by saying it wrongly. We take the name of God himself by not saying it. We don't take it in vain by saying it wrongly. We take it in vain by not saying it. I told you my name. Don't let it be in vain. Speak it. We take the name of Yahweh in vain by not speaking it. That is, and here's the punch. We take his name in vain by not praying. God gave us his personal name in order that we might cry out to him. Oh, Yahweh. And the editors of the prayer book understood this. So they make the first word of the first line of the first true prayer. Oh, Yahweh. The psalmist loved to say it over a hundred times in the book. Oh, Yahweh. Oh, Yahweh. Oh, Yahweh. Oh, Yahweh, our God. Oh, Yahweh, my God. Bringing us to the conclusion of the book in 146 to 50. Each psalm beginning and ending with hallelujah. Hallelujah, you praise Yah a short and tender form of Yahweh. Every time a human being says, hallelujah, you're saying the sacred name. So we are trained to pray by beginning with calling on God's name. Oh, Yahweh. And once we do, we begin, begin to move deeper and deeper into communion and communication with the living God at the center of the universe. And we enter into the gospel. For this God who sees and hears and feels did in fact come down. And he was given the name Yeshua, which means Yahweh saves. Yeshua, Jesus, Jesus, who is the one who answers all the prayers we will pray in the prayer book. Oh, Yahweh, oh, Jesus, blessed name. Just do it. Let us pray. O Lord, O Yahweh, thank you that out of your desire that we live in intimate relationship with you, you have spoken to us in your life-giving word. And thank you that it, you then give us the prayer book by which we can speak back to you. And thank you for now calling us to your table where you once again give us the gift of your very self. In the name of Yeshua, Jesus, we pray. Amen. On the night that the world's true king was betrayed. He took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After they had eaten, he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, Baruch ato Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam, Blessed are you, O Lord God, King of the universe. He gave it to his disciples, saying, this is my cup of the new covenant sealed in my blood. Drink of it, all of you, in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes when the world will know who the real king is.